Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, good afternoon um, and welcome to our first law and policy webinar. Uh, my name is Michiel Stapper and I'm together with Kumert Karaman and Ebru Osman, part of the organizing team of these law and policy webinars. Um, today we will have an excellent panel of speakers uh, that will be discussing law and policy, how to understand law and policy in the urban governance context. Um, but before I introduce uh, the speakers, I would like to briefly talk about the idea behind the law and policy webinars and introduce the uh, YouGovern network that hosts this event. Um, the U Urban Governance Research Network serves as an academic platform for researchers to share, co-produce and co-create knowledge on the topic of urban governance. Uh, the platform was initiated by a Professor Dr. Tuna Tessankok, uh, who is Professor of Urban Governance and Planning at the University of Amsterdam. The main aim of YouGovern is to connect academic, pra academics, practitioners and communities who work in the field of urban governance to create an, an interactive platform to discuss and collaborate on research projects and initiatives. Um, we have three specialized teams. Uh, one is planning and property, one is space and society, and uh, the team that is uh, organizing this is the law and policy team. Um, and today um, we will talk about law and policy um, in the urban context. And um, we have four amazing speakers, Rachel Alterman, Benjamin Davy, Francesco Giordelli, and the discussant Tobias Arnoldson. Um, and we ask the presenters uh, three questions. How to understand law and policy in the urban context? What are useful methods to study law and policy? And how do you think the field of law planning and governance will develop in the future? And what do you think is lacking in the current debates? And the presenters could pick which um, kind of questions they would like to address and will present for more or less um, 12 minutes. Um, during uh, the discussion, the, uh, during the webinars, the session is recorded and we ask the audience to, to remain muted, but please submit questions uh, and engage in discussion uh, via the Q&A. Um, and after, after every presentation, we will um, uh, look whether there are clarifying questions about the presentation. And if there are no clarifying questions, we will move on. And after three presentations, um, Tobias Arnoldson, our discussant, will have the floor to um, weave together the presentations and uh, ask a few questions to the presenters. Um, and um, then we will have a lively uh, discussion. Um, so for now, I want to um, uh, give the floor to uh, Professor uh, Ben Davy. He is Professor of School uh, of Sp Spatial Planning at the Tech Technical University in Dortmund. He's a visiting professor at the Faculty of Law at the University of Johannesburg um, and um, was one of the co-founders of uh, the Planning Law and Property Rights Association and, and was also vice president and president of ASAP. He works on various topics linked to spatial planning and law, such as human dignity and land reform. Um, and now I will stop sharing my screen and we'll give the floor to Ben. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mikhail. Good afternoon. Let me begin with understanding and interpreting law and policy in the urban context. Late 2020, the EU ministers responsible for urban matters issued a policy document, the new Leipzig Charter, subtitle, The Transformative Power of Cities for the Common Good. One important component of the new Leipzig Charter is the just city. And I quote, the transformative power of cities provides equal opportunities and environmental justice for all, regardless of gender, socioeconomic status, age, and origin, leaving no one behind. A just city 
provides opportunities for everyone to integrate in society, unquote. When I first read the new Leipzig Charter, I was reminded to law school. In 1974, I started my law school training at the University of Vienna. Our Roman law professor quoted to us from the Corpus Juris Civilis, the collection of legal opinions codified under the Byzantine Emperor Justinian the Great in the sixth century AD. The corpus, in what became typical of law texts, started with a quote. The lawyer Celsus quoted the lawyer Ulpianus as saying, use es ars boni et equi, or law is the art of the good and the just. Looking back, I guess the quote expressed nicely how many think about the relationship between policy and law. Policy is to come up with wise and just solutions and law artfully transform, transforms those solutions into binding rules. Probably that is also what the authors of the just city vision of the new Leipzig charter expected. The corpus also stated the basic policy underlying law. And I quote Juris Preceptor Suntec, Honeste vivere alterum non ledere suum cuique tribuere. In English, the commandments of the law are these to lead an honest or honorable life, not to harm others, and to give everyone their due. Celsus and Ulpianus practiced natural law, which is based on human reason, divine inspiration, or nature. So what did studying Roman law introduce to me with terms like justice and honor actually teach me? In my first semester in law school, I learned how to possess, buy and sell slaves. Honestly, at the time, I did not notice the abysmal contradiction between policy and law. How can anyone possess slaves and claim to lead an honorable life. Looking back, however, I mastered an important lesson. Everyone who wishes to become a lawyer has to learn. If we cannot ignore the abysmal contradictions between law and policy, we shall grow very unhappy. I ignored the contradictions between an honest life and slave ownership and had a happy law school experience. In legal history, I also learned another important lesson about natural law, a lesson that turned me into a legal positivist. This lesson could be also useful for the just city vision of EU ministers responsible for urban matters. Imagine the 17th century in Europe. A war raged between Catholic rulers and their armies and Protestant rulers and their armies. Both sides claimed to wage a just war in the name of God. The war lasted about 30 years and that was the period of time it took until almost everybody was slain in battle or perished from hunger and pestilence natural law, law inspired by nature, God, or human reason, offers perilous guidance. Hugo Grotius, who wrote, guided law into a different direction. Not natural, but positive law, man-made law, should be considered the best instrument of conflict resolution. Positive law can be a contract or a legal statute, as long as the law is laid down explicitly and leaves no room for divine intervention. Otherwise, stakeholders will only find out that my just war is not your just war, or that my just city is not your just city. Legal positivism 
divorces the law from pre-positive content. Hans Kelsen, the creator of the Austrian constitution from 1920, asserted that law was filled with ideology. Whoever wishes to interpret and apply the law, however, must not fill it with their own ideology. Kelsen's pure theory of law is an inspiring and challenging book, not about pure law, but about methodological purism. I have to admit that in the planning literature or at ASOP or PLPR conferences, legal positivism is scarce. Ideologies roam. I'm afraid we owe to the transdisciplinary nature of spatial planning that we apply lots of different methods, ideas, and ideologies. Coordinating urban land uses requires much more than methodological purism in applying planning law and building codes. I now continue with useful methods in the study of law and policy. My favorite method is reading. Reading is for science what money is for business. Neither works without the other. But reading requires more than command of spelling and grammar. It requires everlasting curiosity in the other. One of my law professors also was a member of the ultra-conservative wing of the Austrian People's Party. I did not like his politics at all, but, but I admit that he promoted my intellectual curiosity. He was the first who taught me Marxism. Reading Marx was not an attempt for him to know thy enemy but resulted from his genuine interest in what others were thinking who did not share their beliefs with him. So my advice is not only to read what confirms to your current views, but purposefully turn to authors you do not know or even do not like. Read Marx and Hayek, Bentham and Arendt, Schumpeter and Coase, Sklar and Nozick. Reading diligently requires to accept and critically reflect many voices, many rationalities. We must beware from taking from reading only what we want to believe. In many Congress sessions, I watch presenters to claim meanings from texts that were their own fabrications and not the true meaning. Wishful thinking is not the same as diligent reading. This brings me to future developments of law, planning, and governance. In the original EU Leipzig Charter from 2007, justice was not mentioned at all. The new Leipzig Charter of 2020 has introduced the vision of the just city. The new Leipzig Charter defines the just city as a city leaving no one behind. The just city vision of the new Leipzig Charter is a step in the right direction. But let me add that I very much hope that deliberations of urban justice become more inclusive in the future. But how could urban governance and planning be more inclusive than leaving no one behind? Well, unfortunately, no one is limited to human animals. Do we really believe that a city can be just if it takes only the needs and aspirations of human animals into account? What about environmental justice in the sense of justice for the environment or justice for non-human animals or justice for trees rivers, mountains. Why does Amazon have rights, but the river Amazonas has no rights? Why does Apple have legal personhood, but personhood is denied to apple trees? The explanation probably relates to the financial interests of economic stakeholders. We know very well 
from the history of legal personhood that rights have often only been granted after enduring struggles. And increasingly, we are experiencing the consequences of not taking nature's rights into account. Widespread flooding, wildfires, climate change and COVID-19 have one common denominator. They all result from taking only human interests, needs and aspirations into account. In most European countries, nature conservation and environmental protection take a welfareist approach. The government or planning authority consider environmental aspects, among other things, whenever they issue plans or decide on planning permissions. This is a noble approach, but it has its limits. I prefer the approach of Eldo Leopold, who in 1949 published a text called The Land Ethic. And I quote, the land ethic enlarges the boundaries of the community to include soils, waters, plants, and animals, or collectively, the land. The land ethic changes the role of Homo sapiens from conqueror of the land community to plain member and citizen of it. It implies respect for his fellow members, also respect for the community as such. I would like to suggest that the next Leipzig Charter enlarges the scope of the just city to the land community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Daisy. Uh, that was very thought-provoking and an interesting kickoff of our webinar series. Uh, there have not been any clarifying questions, so the presentation was probably very clear, which is great. And there's also a little debate in, in Latin in the chat, which is exciting, I think. Um, so I would like to give the floor to uh, uh, Francesco Ciodelli. He is Associate Professor in Urban and Legal Geography at the University of Turin. Um, where he is the director of the Interdepartmental Research Center for Urban Studies, uh, Omero, um, and his research focuses on mainly on the social effect of spatial regulation, in particular with reference to questions of pluralism, diversity, informality, and illeg illegality. Um, so the floor is yours, Francisco. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Now I share my screen. Let me know if you see correctly yes can you see yes okay perfect so thank you thank you very much for this invitation oh, sorry it's yeah. not in presentation mode so if sorry you, it's not yet in the presentation mode uh i'm it's a full screen presentation now no not yet mm, you must uh let's do like this do, yes. do you see my screen yeah. even if it is not Full yeah. screen, right? Okay, yeah. I mean it's not very, very good, but okay, it's it's better. Okay, sorry for these technical problems. Uh, so, sorry, I have to minimize your face as well. Perfectly. Okay, so I've titled my presentation "Policy Planning and Governance Out of the Law" because I'm quite convinced that in many cases, urban studies have a quite let's say, unsatisfactory understanding of the law, of its importance and of its impact. In particular, I think that the law is seen in some cases as external to them. However, this is not obviously the case. And this is the, let's say, it is within this framework which I had conceived my presentation. But let's start from, from the beginning. And the beginning is these three questions. Uh, Mikael, I stressed that we have been provided these three question as guidelines for the seminar, but for a matter of knowledge and a matter of time, I will focus only on the third question and in particular on the second part of this question. What do you think is lacking in current debates uh, around urban studies and governance with reference to law and, and policy? And I, I'm triggered very much also by the first conceptual and definitional question, but the third one is easier. So I will go for the third one. And the fourth for my speech, I will use some rough definitions of both policy and law, as by policy, I mean a set of measures to deal with the specific problem, while by law, I mean a set of binding rules of conduct enacted by a, by a public body. And what I will try to do very briefly in a synthetic way, hopefully not in an oversimplistic way, is to stress three 
shortcomings in current urban research in geography, planning, sociology, political science around law. I will focus only on law and not on policy. I'm sorry, but I'm much more expert on law, so I think I can provide something more meaningful uh, about this. Uh, so the first shortcoming, okay. The respect of the law is usually taken for granted and the use unlawfulness is seen as an exception. This is the first, short, uh, the, the first shortcoming I want to stress. It seems to me that we have a quite positivistic and naive view of the reality as almost always contained within the boundaries of legality. Or when we think to illegality, we tend to have a sort of, let's say, orientalistic view of illegality. Illegality relates to the global south, to Italy, obviously, to some former Soviet countries, but it's seen as an exception. I'm sorry for you who come from uh, the UK, the Netherlands, the Germany, but illegality is a global phenomenon, okay? So this must be the, the, the point of departure. It's not confined to some countries, but it's a global phenomenon. And this sort of, let's say, neglection of the legal side of the world is also surprisingly uh, typical of some, some theories related to urban governance, which are more sensitive toward informal and opaque arrangements. I'm referring in particular to urban regime theory about urban governance. I, I mean, I, 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 I'm sure that you are all familiar with this theory. And according to urban regime theory, public and private actors taking part in urban governance are usually self-interested. They form coalition which are in many cases informal, which are uh, hidden, non-transparent. In many cases, we can see this coalition as unfair shortcut for influencing local policies, but in the large majority of works about around urban governance and urban regime, such coalition are always within the realm of illegality. Therefore, the resulting picture is a sort of gentlemanly urban capitalism and, and politics. This is the overall picture which is produced by this book of theory. Urban capitalists, professionals, politicians, civil servants, they always accept the rule of the game. They always accept, obey the law. However, this, this is not the case in many instances. People we have to, to deal with when we look at the reality of urban governance are not this kind in the picture, but of, of this kind. This guy in the picture is Massimo Carminati. He's one of the leading figures of neo-fascist terrorism in Italy in the 70s. Later, he was one of the leading figures of the Roman Nob. And according to the Roman tribunal, between 2008 and 2015, at least, so for seven years at least, he deeply influenced several municipal policies in Europe. It was at the center of urban governance of the capital city of Italy. These people, not the previous, uh, the previous one. It created a sort of dark and criminal uh, urban regime which influenced several urban policies in, in the city of Rome. But this is not enough because in, in, in the same period, another investigation stressed another element of illegality which we must consider, which is the systemic use of corruption by legal entrepreneurs which has characterized for decades uh, urban development in Rome. This is a picture of the one of the major recent urban development projects in Rome, the new stadium for uh, a soccer team, uh, I say, as Roma. According to the tribunal, many transactions related to this stadium were, were, were characterized, characterized by corruption. What I want to, to, to say quite briefly, schematically, is the respect of the law is not a necessary condition for urban governance planning and development. We have to take illegality into serious consideration. The second shortcoming of current uh, research on, uh, on urban governance law and policy is that the complexity of the law, it seems to me that is often reduced too much. The legal world is extremely complex. We can build up different typologies or taxonomy of the law according to sources. Uh, different level of political bodies, regional, national, international, often different kinds of normative sources, judicial bodies, tribunal, uh, courts, and so forth. We, we can have typologies related to kinds of, of law, civil law, penal law, administrative law, so on and so forth. According to the contents, we have obligations which are different from permissions, which are different from prohibition. This variety is relevant for our analysis of urban governance, urban issues, but this is often neglected. And an element of this complexity, which uh, that I want to stress, is, is the following one. Among these reductionists, let's say about the complexity of the law, one 
uh, element of reduction is seems to me very, uh, I mean, uh, very problematic. It is the, the fact that we, not in all the cases, in particular in planning, as I'm referring now uh, specifically to planning, we don't distinguish between low in books and low in action. Why? Uh, where by law in books are indicated legal norms as written by, by lawmakers. So we tend to refer almost always in planning to law in books, while we know that there is also another, let's say, normative framework of reference, which is the law produced by the action of civil servants in the implementation of, of law in books. And this is law in action. And law in action differs from law in books. And in some cases, this gap is huge. As it is has been stressed by several seminal books, so I'm just mentioning these books, Street Level Bureaucracy by Marco Lipsky, but I could mention several other books. Well, what is the, the, the point is that this gap between law in books and law in action is a space of opportunity, is a space of, of possibility for many urban phenomena. And if we don't recognize this gap, we, we fail to understand completely this phenomenon. Once again, a quite short example. In the case of urban development in Italy, we don't have only loan books, so something which is uh, transgressing or complying with the law, but we have uh, different nuances, as you can see in, in the table, of statuses of uh, housing legality or illegality. And this different, this diversity of status is related exactly to the internal complexity of the law, and in particular, to the working of civil servants in producing law in action. If we fail to understand this difference between law in action and law in books, for sure we don't understand the complexity of urban development in Italy and several other uh, European countries. And to conclude, the last shortcoming I want to stress is the fact that in some cases, it seems to me that the impact of the law is oversimplified as well. We tend to have this quite dichotomic and simplistic view. Compliance versus non-compliance, effectiveness versus ineffectiveness. If a, a behavior conforms with the law, the law is effective. If otherwise the law is, is not effective. However, once again, the reality is far more complex. As you can see in, in this table, I don't have time to, to explain this table. I've ex used one entire paper to, to explain this paper. You can uh, see the title of the paper below, below the, uh, the slide. But what is the point? The point is of, of this, uh, this picture is that in many cases, the law is effective also when it is transgressive. So conformity is not a necessary condition for effectiveness of the law. The law can be, be effective even without conformity. So the impact of the law is broader than we usually assume. And it is in place also when there are some transgressions. Just an example to clarify this, this cryptical point, a uh, thing to, to, to a thief. This is a, an example provided by Max Weber. A thief masks his face when he steals. When masking his face, he acts in light of laws and penalties against theft, even if he breaks this law. So this broader understanding of the impact of the law is crucial for a sophisticated understanding of urban governance and urban phenomena. So to, to wrap up, in a very, uh, let's say, synthetic way, I think that a deeper understanding of planning, policy, and governance require at least the consideration of three points. The first one is the possibility of illegal acts and actors. The second is the complexity of the law, in particular, the divergence between law in books and law in action. And the third point is the, the fact that the extent of the impact of the law is not limited to action that willingly conform to the law, but there are also action which are transgressive, but nonetheless, uh, on, on them, law is effective. That's it. Uh, I'm done. And thank you for your patience. Thank you so much, Francesco. It was very interesting and interesting to see that we moved from justice to illegal practices in the city. Um, and um, we will, I think the audience will have many questions, uh, but for now we will move on to the, the final pre uh, presentation uh, by uh, Professor Rachel Altman. She is Professor of Urban Planning and Law at Technion Israel Institute of Technology. Um, and she is one of the founding, uh, she is the founding president of the International Academic Association on Planning Law and Property Rights. Um, her research interests include comparative planning and law, land use regulation, uh, land policy and property rights, housing policy, and the implementation of uh, public policy. Um, and I will give the floor to Rachel Ottoman. Thank you very much. I will uh, upload uh, my presentation. Uh, 
Um, and I'll uh, try to make this a full screen because I do have animation. That's always a problem. Should be control F5, right? Yes. It's not working. Well, we'll try to, um, unless somebody has a, a good tip. Um, I don't know, actually. Maybe. <laughs> Oh, here it is. Yeah. OK. Um, so thank you very much for this invitation. Apologies, some uh, family constraints. So if you, as you've noticed, I have been moved to the last slot. Uh, since I cannot see uh, the watch, the clock now uh, in this full screen, please uh, give me a time. Uh, I have, I what, 10 minutes? Yes, I will. So give me the five minutes. Um, I want to talk about uh, the role of uh, planning law, and uh, I call this presentation between devil and uh, angel, and uh, my credits, um, of course, I loved being the founding president of uh, PLPR, and uh, uh, Ben Davey is the third president, um, and I hope that we have uh, changed, contributed to uh, uplifting um, the uh, a scene of uh, research and planning law. Uh, and thanks very much. And, and my uh, uh, congratulations on the establishment of the Network for Urban Governance uh, Research. I think this is a wonderful initiative and uh, there'll be lots of cooperation. And in today's uh, global and Zooming world, that will be even more. So um, what do I mean by this image? First, I wanna say that I have uh, my own triple guides in planning policy and law. My own triple guides. Uh, there's also a chapter that I published in this uh, Pioneers of Planning Thought, uh, where I set this out, not in a funny presentation, but uh, more articulate. And those who want it, I'll put it on the uh, chat later on. So what are my triple guides? The first one is planning theory, which for me sets the norms of what should be. And I call this uh, in that chapter, the image, my image is the beacon. It gives the direction, uh, at least not all planning law, but a lot of planning law is normative. Some planning law is empirical, a lot of planning law is, is normative. So many of us know here what it is, and uh, I won't take the time uh, to read what it is, but it, it also provides ethical norms. And uh, Ben Davey is very, uh, strong um, on, on, on in this realm. And uh, of course, this presentation spoke a lot uh, to the ethical norms um, that are embedded in planning theory. And then uh, my other uh, guide to life is uh, implementation analysis. Now implementation analysis is what really happens. Uh, yes, lawyers call it, as Francesco said, they call it law and books. Um, in the books. I think it's a very na naive statement by lawyers. I also have a law degree. I always thought it was a naive statement. Of course, law on the books is not important. It is for uh, doctor, uh, doctrine, doctrine, doctrinal legal research, but obviously there's a huge life out there and the connecting uh, element between uh, law, which is always on the books or in, the, or in court decisions, it's always on the books and reality. It's a whole area of many disciplines and real life, and that I call it here implementation analysis. That is how to mediate um, what, what in life really mediates be, between uh, the public norms expressed in law and what happens in practice. And there's a huge world out there, and the rule is law, um, the kind of law that we're talking about in planning, will never get fully implemented. Public policy never gets fully implemented, and therefore, understanding the uh, linkage, the link, uh, the missing elements between uh, law uh, 
or public theory normative part and real life is implementation uh, analysis um, in, uh, in, in the research realm and uh, any politician or any uh, top public decision maker, any uh, planner in, uh, in government will know that between uh, plans or law, law is also a plan, it is, of course, a, a plan of what a behavior should be like, uh, institutional behavior or people's behavior should be like. There are many, many actors, uncertainties, and the best book I like I, for that is still my favorite, is still Implementation by Press Van Angul Wildowski from the 70s, where they developed a schematic uh, probability model to show that within two or three decision steps, you would like your, the likelihood of actually getting full implementation of your plan or of your law will go well below 50%. And with a few more decision tracks, it goes to uh, down to almost uh, 1% uh, in chances of implementation. So uh, in my career too, I've, I've done, well, I, I am doing planning theory, less so today, a lot of implementation analysis, and then comes um, planning law. But in planning law, I would like to distinguish two very different elements. And in the conversations that occur in, um, uh, in uh, PLPR, and probably here too, uh, people often speak about these different elements um, and, and they're extremely different also in law. The administrative law aspects of planning law, uh, it, it, they pertain to who establishes the institutions, what are the powers, who makes the decisions, in what procedures are the regular decisions, who can influence and how can influence. And also, one could also add, what is the role of the courts? In civil law systems, uh, the differentiation or the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the cleavage between administrative law and the other parts of planning law, the land-related regulation instruments, is quite distinct in, I don't know civil law that well, but I think that there are, in some countries, greater differences in the training of the persons who deal with the administrative aspects and the, the legal training of the other people who, who understand uh, uh, property, land, uh, better. In the common law countries to which my own country belongs, all uh, most uh, former British uh, colonies and protectorates. Um, and uh, there, uh, the, these two are merged together. And therefore, when I study law, or when I teach law, or when I research law, uh, these two are uh, together. And they're very important. They're, they're together in planning theory. Uh, they're together um, because the decisions about uh, plans, uh, that who makes the decisions, what powers, what are the procedures, who has access, uh, also influences the outcomes. And the outcomes uh, on, on the ground, the planning regulation that we know, development rights, expropriation, that is um, compulsory purchase in British lingo, eminent domain, American lingo, uh, all the other instruments we talk about, land value capture, so these are land related uh, instruments and they're uh, different uh, areas of, of law, uh, and, and however, in planning, they're bridged together very strongly, and that is one of the elements that distinguishes uh, planning law from other instruments. Now, there's always a strange relationship between these two areas, and also between planning theory and implementation analysis. And I want to emphasize that law is not justice. Even constitutional law is not the same as justice. Uh, law is controversial, controversial, and I must sadly say that when law deals with land, land regulation, land property can never reach the, uh, the vision um, uh, that uh, of, of, of equality in the cities uh, that Ben spoke about. That will never happen when land is concerned. Land is the major resource of uh, households and businesses and land regulation always changes them. It always changes in time. Uh, over time, it is almost impossible. There's ways of mitigating 
the disparities, but uh, saying that a city will equally serve everybody who will be equal is impossible uh, through planning law. And uh, yes, we've seen regimes that try to do this in, in totally other ways. Um, so that's a reality check. Now, uh, see if I have some more time. I want to talk about this image about the devil and the angel. So let me put my devil again. There is my devil and there is my angel. So law can be the devil and law can also be an angel. It depends not only on the decision makers, it also can change over time. What was an angel at one point in the city with changes, with gentrification, with uh, the opposite of gentrification, shall we say, uh, pouring the city or whatever image, making it, uh, um, these change over time. So the images, the devil, the devil of planning law is one can first say that planning law in, in many contexts is unnecessary and maybe life is better. And when planning law intervenes, it changes good things. And Francesca would love this. Um, Self-regulating urbanity predates public planning. We today love the vernacular historical cities to come and visit, but actually planning regulation either kills these or, or gentrifies them. That's a history of, of, of modern planning. It has changed the vernacular. The vernacular that we like to visit today is full of tourists and has been gentrified. So yeah, planning law doesn't perverse very well, with uh, history, culture, and so on. So sometimes no planning law, actually no planning law is what created these uh, vernacular historic cities that uh, we like to visit in uh, Bruges and in central uh, Athens and uh, so on. Uh, current, uh, oh, sorry, Rome, uh, Francesco, I'm sorry, I apologize, and so on, uh, and Jerusalem and so on. Um, current benefits of informality are often killed by legal impositions. I've been studying this uh, quite intensively over the past, well, I started this uh, in the uh, late 90s, but empirical work uh, recently. And yes, uh, public law and uh, under administrative law aspect of public law, there must be enforcement. And Enforcement is bad news very often because enforcement is often discriminatory and enforcement also sometimes and often enforcement enforces the bad things of planning law uh, that create disparities. Building codes have managed, and Ben mentioned this too, building codes have managed to uh, control the cities for the important things. And that is for safety, uh, for housing, uh, safe housing, healthy housing, and those have been enough in many contexts. So one could say that uh, uh, planning laws are uh, in some ways unnecessary. And when you intervene with something that works, um, it doesn't always create the better. Law is very heavy. Institutions are very heavy. They don't flow with life, with human behavior, not easily. And human behavior often creates better things. That, uh, last point on this um, devil side, is that planning laws are not very relevant for developing countries. That is a fact of life. What is relevant for developing countries is property law. And planning law is eh, somewhere there. It's often really not implemented because you need strong administrative law institutions to implement planning law, to make planning law, and to implement that. And developing countries, part of the definition is that the, admin the administrative uh, institutions and the constitutional administrative law are. Um, are bad. Other uh, bad things in the devil is it is a guise for discrimination. Planning law is inherently discriminatory across locations, across zoning plans. Uh, it is a international, uh, internal social exclusion through zoning. Uh, zoning, certainly the US and to some extent the Canadian example is yes, it creates huge exclusion. And you see the difference between the Trump government, government and the Biden government will both try to find, to, to fight uh, exclusion to some, in some way, but all these elements in the American constitutional law barely uh, manage. I know that you want to tell me that I should almost finish, Michael. 
uh, unintend unintended um, social selection through piling up of regulations, more regulations that you want to make better communities, better design, uh, uh, often better public services, they increase costs and costs are uh, discriminatory, uh, uh, socially selective and discriminatory. And plan approval procedures are long and they're unfit for urban dynamics very often. And also when you come to access for hearings, judicial review before the planning bodies, anything that has to do with heavy administration, heavy law, often you need representation by lawyers or by planners or by valuers. This is inherently discriminatory and enforcement is unequal. Uh, I just want this, I'll conclude with exclusionary, exclusionary sorry. The US is extremely exclusionary in its entire, almost entire um, uh, urban pattern. Uh, there is a lot of publications about exclusion, but uh, empirical research that they, the key regulations that have won great court of appeals such as in New Jersey have hardly influenced real life. And the angel, let me say some things about the angel, the substance is uh, to try to have minimal standards of quality of life, to provide public amenities and services according to pre-planned needs, to mitigate market-driven social segregation, to provide greater certainty for residents, investors in the economy, to provide transportation planning that can uh, be a more uh, create greater equality, to enhance public values through design and historic preservation, to sustain environment, climate change, mitigation, and so on, and the procedures to enable direct involvement. And a lot of planning theory and changes in planning law are oriented to the angel um, to mitigate the market influence in decision-making, to mitigate it. it. We cannot, we have to recognize in the developed part that these are inherent. We can only mitigate them through more public participation and more equality to be direct advocates um, through advocacy planning, direct advocates of the disempowered. And let us not forget that when there is no planning regulation, um, and this is mostly property rights. Um, yes, we can get this, but this is not because of no planning. This is much more inherent um, economic, social, and legal structure that has created these. Thanks very much. Yes, Thank accountability you. for future generations. That's what we need. Thank that's you so my, much. That's my, our, for our grandchildren, of course. Thank um, you. They're very cute. Thank you so much for, for your presentation. Uh, it was very inspiring. Um, and we are receiving a lot of questions. So please continue putting your questions in the chat or in the Q&A. Uh, uh, we are very excited to, to, to read them. But first, I will give the floor to uh, uh, Tobias Arnoldsen. He is um, an assistant professor at Tilburg Law School at the Department of Public Law and Governance. Um, he, he, he works as a social legal uh, scientist and, and he focuses on uh, the role of law in caring men, uh, men who values an intimate connection to the world and shapes it through care. Um, I will give the floor to Tobias. Thank you very much, Michiel. Um, first, let me, uh, first of all, let me th thank you very, very much for three wonderful presentations. I'm sure they will enrich my own research tremendously, and I think they will also be very, very helpful to the viewers. And I also really like the metaphor of law as the historical angel and the historical devil flipping into its, op into its opposite. I myself take a rather genealogical perspective to law, mostly historical, and I'm interested in the development of law, especially in regard to environmental conflicts, health conflicts, and care indeed. Now, I come from a social legal background, and my perspectives are, usually, are, are responsive law and the development of legal consciousness, also with an historic, within a historic perspective. Now, I'm working... Currently on the theoretical foundations of the Dutch Environment and Planning Act, 
which is an effort to combine attention to efficiency and sustainability by empowering private parties as well as residents to foster initiatives. Now, these presentations, all three of them, touch on the, uh, the discussions in the Netherlands. And what is the difference between law and policy? Is there or is there not a certain shared methodology? What blind spots do policy and law currently have? And indeed, can law be devilish or can it also be angel-like? Now, what I noticed is that sometimes law comes to the fore as something that is just there, that is taken for granted in a way, as a kind of artful translator of policy goals, as Professor Davy put it, or as a certain kind of order that is overestimated in its effects because people in practice circumvent it. And I would like to wager a couple of remarks there. And we can say that policy is to come up with wise and just solutions and then law artfully transform those into binding rules. But then law is merely considered as a certain craft, right? As a, transform, as a translator of policy into goals, which can be done or good or bad, or in a faithful translation way or a, le or, um, a less faithful translation. But in any case, law in this sense acts like setting the rules of the game. And indeed, some play by the rules and some do not play by the rules, as Professor Ciardelli so emphatically pointed out. Now, I wonder if law is merely a crafty translation of policy or does it add something unique to the game, which is played by planning theory, by policy, something that is hidden when we think of law as only an ordering tool that's merely a translator of goals. In that sense, I was struck by Professor Davies presentation, first taking a very positivistic eye, positivistic light, but at the end arriving at something like a natural law perspective, advocating a rights-based approach to realizing environmental justice in the broadest of ways. Now, there should be rights for nature, rights for trees, trees, maybe rights for rivers in an environmentally just city. However, is not a right approach itself, the approach of human rights or rights, fundamental rights, not itself laden with all kinds of assumptions. I think a right is to say, hey, you are impinging on my stuff. You are trespassing my land. You are taking my can. They propose ideally a subject that can use these rights and call the violator to task. Why did you violate my task, my rights? If you have no justification for violating my rights, then you will need to pay the price. Often, most literally, yeah? you commit a tortious act. Now, an environmentally just city in which rights are awarded to rivers and trees is of course thinkable, but an order, an, a thorny question then immediately raises its hand. The question of representation. Who do we trust to speak for nature? There will have to be a human. So representation of nature will be will wield actual power to humans. Huh? The representative of nature who gets to speak for nature will become a powerful human being, which, um, which is essentially causes all kinds of, of power relations to occur. And one lesson that every legal theorist here in Tilburg gets hammered into his brain by legal philosopher Hans Lindau is that law is about representation and about inclusion and exclusion and can never be a neutral arbiter. The function of illegality in planning in Rome gives a nice insight into this dynamic. The legal order demands that only certain interests are represented and excludes others, right? For instance, we allow representatives of the people because they, we consider that they work for the common good, but we do not allow only purely personal interests stemming from greed and prepared to use extraordinary measures. However, these other interests will find a way through illegality and this illegality actually might even strengthen certain groups. The groups that are willing to take more risks can reap higher rewards because they can engage in illegal behavior. The characteristics of those who wield power in planning are configured in a certain way by law, but exactly in opposition to it. You need to be tough, you need to know the highway, but you also need to know the back alleys, you need to be a risk taker, you need to be fearless to some extent. And in this case, law does not act as a given, but is a formative influence on who is in and who is out and what kind of 
possibilities are open to them. Now, similarly, as Professor Alterman stated, there's this gap between planning theory and administrative law. Law necessarily perhaps mistranslates the theory because it has its own concepts and nomenclature. And the mismatch is exacerbated by the difference between law in the books and law in action. So we see all kinds of misunderstandings, mistranslations, which may be even, yeah, may be even inevitable because of the different disciplines that we're talking about. Now, the missing link between the law and its real life analysis um, is that there are all kinds of actors in between and the likelihood of the interpretation of the law become, uh, becoming less and less by all the steps in between. Now, my contention is therefore that the line between policy and law might well still be blurry. And the positivist in me regrets this. I'm uh, trained as a classical lawyer. And I like the image of the wordsmith who crafts binding rules, uh, crimes binding rules out of policy, out of goals set by policy. But in this case, the tools also prefigure the product, so to speak. And perhaps we need to take into account there are existing biases and assumptions in the law that, um, that, causes, uh, that, that, that causes mismatches between law in the books and the increasingly complex and rapidly changing society that it tries to cater for. So I wonder in that sense, what you think? Does law and policy increasingly intertwine? Do we lose sight of what law and its conceptions bring to the table? And well, the, the provocative assertion of Professor Alterman that the just city will never happen. Why will it not happen? Can these mistranslations be in any way redeemed? Is there a method to come to terms with this mismatch between policy and law? I really wonder what the other speakers think of this provocative reality check. Thank you, Tobias. And I already saw on the screens that the panelists already wanted to, to jump in. Uh, to the, uh, the points that Tobias was raising. So it's one of the, uh, I see that uh, Rachel already unmuted herself. So uh, do you like to respond to Tobias? Uh, I, I agree with him. <laughs> <laughs> it was very, very important. And, and yes, I agree with the analysis and I, I share it. I think it goes very deeply uh, into uh, the theory of law and jurisprudence and match and, and looks into social science and social behavior and real life behavior. Yes, I agree. Uh, regarding, uh, so um, was I making a very uh, provocative statement? Uh, maybe to this audience it's provocative. I think to many other uh, audiences, it's not provocative. It's very representative of what happens in life and how difficult it is uh, to, to change the disparities that are always there when land is regulated. Those disparities, uh, the uh, communist regimes were not able to eliminate those disparities, even though land was nationalized and, uh, and decisions were, uh, they, they eliminated it to some extent, yes, to some extent. Um, I, I wanna tell the, the story that when I visited uh, um, East, uh, East Berlin for the first time. As an Israeli, I couldn't visit it. Uh, that was not allowed. Israelis were not allowed to get in until Germany was reunited. And at that time, um, those of you who, who recall it, Ben probably does uh, certainly, uh, East Berlin was very, very different for them. The, the, the inner city uh, residences were uh, deteriorated because uh, the, the good thing was to move to the better housing that was built outside. But then instantly, the, the decision makers who may have chosen a good apartment uh, further out found that the poorer people who stayed in the inner city became, became uh, uh, rich owners of... Okay, so... Um, uh, Land regulation has lots of uh, surprises, but it also uh, it, 
but it also is very difficult to, to turn around. Uh, let me, I, I mentioned uh, Trump and Biden. The, a big issue now in the United States is can, um, can local governments uh, continue to regulate land so that only single family uh, homes can be there? That's the usual thing. Uh, now there's attempts at, in some states to impose, but that when you say to impose, that is so uh, uh, against uh, um, politics and life. So it became a Trump and Biden all the way there. It's not that they're going to that Biden is going to change life, but this minor, the only intervention was not that you cannot do single family, but that certain single family homes may become double family homes. The exclusion is so, is so inherent that is so uh, deep, uh, deeply entrenched so that in, in, in most American suburbs, which is most of American urbanity, um, they are not allowed to build double or four story buildings. So, uh, and these things are, cannot change retroactively and they will not change forward. There's entrenched behavior and certainly entrenched property rights. That was just, just one example. So what if I speak to other people, to real estate people, to land valuers, to economists, what I said would not be a surprise. But however, that does not mean that making the angel steps, I didn't have enough time to dwell with the angel, but I think that's because in planning theory and in this group, we are angel supporters in planning theory. And here, we, that's what we're here for in planning, in, in good planning. So I didn't need to talk so, so much about the angel. I can add to the angel. I can add renewable energies. I just fi I finished a comparative research project on land regulation for renewable energies in nine countries. You can see that definitely when and if planning law and regulations go forward, they can change urbanity a lot. But uh, it, it now I, let's ask the sociologists uh, how many such issues are, but in, th in terms of property rights, by the way, uh, renewable energies are uh, a positive and very minorly a negative. There, there, there are kinds of changes that are that can be made and will be made. On the other hand, uh, sea level rise and property rights, I have a new PhD, oh yeah, a current PhD uh, project that's almost finished. Property rights are not moving very quickly due to sea level rise and uh, property rights, including uh, planning regulation. So that's why I dwelled on the devil and the reality check, but the angels all, that's, we're all angels and certainly that's what I've been trying to do and teach all my life. Thank you, thank you so much for this answer. Uh, Professor, uh, sorry, Ben wanted to jump in. He raised his hand, so we give the floor to him. Okay, thank you. Just a quick one. Tobias, you uh, very diligently um, noticed the arc in my uh, presentation. I started from legal positivism and ended with land use ethics. And that is my biography. I started as a constitutional and administrative law person in Austria, and I ended in Dortmund uh, from, uh, well, maybe not as a natural law person, but very much interested in questions of land use ethics. Why is that? Um, I, like probably many other people uh, in these past two years, have discovered that one of the um, things that happened with COVID-19 showed us that unethical behavior can be very, very dangerous. And not just very dangerous in the, in the sense that we are compromising our souls and in the next world we will uh, have to uh, regret our sins, but uh, dangerous in the sense that uh, this mass tourism and, and massive air travel or the way people are congregating in places like Ischgl um, has, has been contributing a lot to the spreading of, of, of the virus. And if I, if I go back and look at how 
in Austria, for example, many people who are concerned with environmental ethics for decades have regretted and complained about the way tourism is organized in Tyrol, uh, then I would say they are the compass. They have been the uh, seismograph telling us what, what is going to, to, to happen. And uh, that is the reason why I think that uh, the just city, if we want to uh, pursue this uh, vision, has to take into account other species too. And the upcoming ASOP uh, Congress uh, in uh, Tartu is going to uh, talk about justice for species if uh, people participating follow the queue. Yeah, the representatives of nature will be very powerful as the representatives of Amazon and Shell and uh, Siemens are very, very powerful uh, people. Uh, and uh, at the same time, Amazon and Siemens, uh, these are very lifeless accumulations of capital. And uh, to accept their personhood uh, requires a rather weird thinking. I believe, and let me keep it at that. Thank you very much for your comments. I greatly enjoyed that. Thank you so much. Uh, and Francesco, uh, I see you on mute, so I would yeah, give the floor yeah, to you. Yeah, just uh, a couple of comments and not, not so much uh, to say, also because uh, Rachel said, said many things I, I share, I agree with, and in particular, thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Tobias, for, for stressing the fact that, I mean, uh, law is not neutral, as well as planning is not neutral. So thank you, Rachel, for stressing also the, the negative externalities, the negative side, the devil side of, of planning. Uh, what, one point which, I mean, uh, I think we should always to keep in mind is that obviously we are all, always angel, support, angel supporters, but the point is that we can have a different definition of what is paradise and what is the hell. I mean, I'm always very skeptical about all these discussion about the just city if we don't predefine what just city is. And I think that we have many different, and hopefully, and we are lucky that we have different def definition of just city since there are different theories of justice. So the point is that when we speak about angels and devils, we have to do like uh, Raquel was saying. So stressing exactly what, do, what we mean by something which is hell and something which is paradise. Otherwise we run the risk of, I mean, not entering into, not, not putting our hands on the ground. I mean, that, that, that's my point. When we think about, uh, uh, when we speak about ethical issues, we have always to say what is the ethical point of departure. So what is just according to our theory of justice, because there are different theories of justice around the world and we are lucky uh, of this diversity. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And I think uh, Ben already uh, uh, said in his presentation also that um, the discussion about uh, justice should be more inclusive and that there should be deliberations about these different notions of justice. And um, maybe Ben, can you elaborate a little bit on that? to also answer maybe the question of Francesco. I would like to continue where Francesco has stopped. Yes, uh, different concepts of justice are around. And the question is how we as planners, as urbanists, as uh, geographers, uh, economists should react to uh, the multiverse of concepts of justice. Um, Hans Kielsen, who I quoted uh, earlier, uh, had a very, uh, I would say, brutal uh, view on that. He said justice does not exist. The multitude of justice theories prove that justice does not exist. It's an illusion. Uh, I do not believe that at all. And I say that as a positivist. What I do believe is that, in fact, there are and there exist several concepts of justice, and they cannot be um, looked at from the perspective who is right or who is wrong. Hayek is not more right than Benson, and um, Rawls is not more right than Hayek or the other way around. Rather, we have to accept that we are living in the world of polyrationality, of plural ideas of justice, and my suggestion in an earlier book was to turn 
around the view and not to consider what is the best concept of justice, but what is injustice and how can we avoid injustice when we make decisions on using urban land, when we make decisions on building highways, when we make decisions on environmental protection and climate change. And just one last sentence, it's interesting if you look at uh, the literature, if you look at news, if you look at uh, talk shows, people very often agree on what is unjust, people who could never agree on what is the best concept of justice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Rachel, please jump in. Uh, yes, I, I, I looked at the, I'm not very good at looking at chats because I like to listen <laughs> to what's happening. So uh, I did see some, and if anybody else wants to ask a question, it might be much, I think it'd be fun if they're, can they be uh, on, online? Can people ask? Uh, no. Oh, no. I see, I see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there is um, there is uh, two questions from my friend and colleague, uh, Evangelia Bala. Um, and uh, her nickname is Leah. Leah is asking about um, implementation analysis. Uh, can this be uh, done? Um, yes, the, the, the fields of uh, public policy as a science, uh, as, a, as a research, and uh, public administration, uh, I think are very important for, for, for uh, planners to learn. Uh, even the word budget, how many planners know the ways that budgets are made. There's whole theories of empirical analysis of budgeting, a whole area, a whole discipline about budgeting. Now, when we talk about uh, planning law and regulations and about planning, we assume budgets. We're assume, assuming budgets not only for the public administration plus enforcement. We're assuming budget that, that local governments or central governments will be investi investing. Um, so, and, and I, I don't know to what extent we, we are teaching our planners to understand how budgets are made, how accounting is made, how public finance works with the, as an element in implementation um, as, as an unknown in implementation of uh, public uh, planning. So absolutely, yes, more and more research on that and more and more teaching of our students. We are a bit better now. This connects a little bit with the uh, comment about uh, India. Um, uh, it, uh, the, the person who uh, asked about it or commented about India uh, cites uh, Ananya Roy, who is indeed uh, one of everybody, at least one of my uh, lime lies, my, my beacons uh, in her research, and I know her personally. Um, um, and uh, she comments, uh, or he, he cites her research or mentions her research about uh, India, where she uh, talks about the uh, planning administration or planning organizations and uh, recommends that or advocates that these be changed or actually records the reality where these are changed with informality of decision making. Uh, well, of course. Now, uh, we are better in, in the global north now in teaching our students, or at least my students, uh, real estate. So I, I mentioned budgeting, that's public finance. That's not real estate. The two different worlds. We're uh, teaching them a little bit, or we should be teaching them to understand the real estate environment, because that's not only real estate uh, companies, it's also everybody's people's homes, if they own or rent them, we have to understand some uh, uh, household real estate and of course companies real estate. We're a bit of that, that better at that. We're also studying negotiated development, which is legally very controversial. It's been one of my topics since the 80s, empirical and conceptual. This ties in with value capture and so on. So we're better at that. Uh, now about India, I've never been to India um, and I'm not an expert in India. I know much more about China and uh, some African countries, South America. But in India to me seems like one of what I call two tier countries, two level countries. India has sophisticated public administration and law and, and courts, a court system that works. I wouldn't, when I kind of generalized about developing countries, of course, this kind of lecture, um, 
I'm not sure I would put India. Some parts of India are definitely with the characteristics of developing countries, and some kind are like what I call the two-tier country. Uh, many South American countries I would designate as or so in, on one level they have high economy, high institutions, take Brazil with its uh, intellectual and academic uh, pro productivity. And yet when you go into the slums, you know uh, what these are and you know the injustices and you know the, yes, I like the criminal aspects that uh, were mentioned before. Um, I think both Francesco, both, both Francesco and I are, have been studying uh, illegality and, and yes, Francesco has published on the, uh, the non-romantic, and I've tried to as well, the non-romantic parts of illegality. Uh, that is the, uh, uh, almost the mafia parts, but uh, there's lots of uh, in between. So romanticization is a danger in teaching planning. So I, I, I would think that, yes, this is why I talk about angels and the, and the devils and to try to teach the in-between and not to only, only romanticize. Yeah. So anyhow. Thank, thank you so much. We also received a uh, question from uh, Francesca. Uh, and maybe um, because Francesco's case in Rome um, relates to it, and Francesco, maybe he can address it. Um, and uh, Francesca is asking regarding the construction of law and regulations. Do you think um, the role of what do you think the role of power um, relations are in these pro processes? To what extent, or in which cases? does the power of law outshine or stays behind? Okay, thank you for this question. I cannot read it. I, I, I cannot manage also the chart and the question and answer section, but yeah, I, I have understood a, a bit the question. I, I would say if the question if, is, if this kind of power relation counts, count, I mean, definitely they count and I agree with, with Raquel. There are many, uh, let's say, black spots in, in, in the way in which we, we teach planning. One of, of these uh, black spots is also the way in which planning decision and planning law is, is produced in terms of power relations, in terms of, of processes. Also because in, in some cases, these processes are, are hidden. I mean, uh, uh, urban governance and urban region theory focus exactly on, on this science. So the informal aspect of producing uh, a policy or producing a law. What I, I wanted to argue, and I want, I tried to, to stress with my analysis of Rome, is that this is not enough. Informality is not enough. There is also a more, a darker side of informality, which is illegality, which is criminality. We have to be able to, to explore if we, have, if we want to have a full understanding of the functioning of urban governance and policy in many countries, maybe not in all the countries, but for sure in Italy, many countries of the global south, former Soviet Union, in Israel as well, they have several problems of, of this kind. So definitely the answer is yes, I didn't touch upon it for, for a matter of time, but thank, thank you for stressing this, uh, my ne neglection. Yes. Yes, go ahead, Rachel. <laughs> or... Oh, no, I just agree okay. with <laughs> Francesco. <laughs> great. It's great that you all agree. <laughs> um, then uh, a question uh, from Tuna for, for, for Ben, um, because he asked if you can go a little bit further on the idea of, of, of land justice, um, because he's curious to, to hear from you um, how this can be achieved. Um, uh, because under today's market-driven conditions, uh, especially considering public law ownership, this can be difficult. Can, for example, public land ownership bring justice to the city building because cases from Amsterdam show it's not enough. What is needed more according to you? Thank you very much, Tuna, for this question. I believe that I'm not the only one who was very much surprised that Susan Feinstein in her book on the just city came up with uh, Amsterdam is the just city, uh, but maybe if you are looking at the city from far away, you get that impression. I believe that I should mention that I come from a city with a lot of public land ownership, the city of Vienna, and uh, traditionally social housing in Vienna has been cited as a, an example of wonderful public policy. Uh, I'm still 
confident that this uh, assessment is true. However, of course, you will see in Vienna also a lot of mismanagement. So uh, property by a municipality or property uh, by uh, the state is not a guarantee that uh, justice will prevail. Uh, it's a guarantee that the uh, profits from using land will go in uh, a different direction than in a uh, land market that is driven by private actors. Uh, and let me add another aspect that has always fascinated me, and that is that in law as well as in policy, it is often very different to differentiate uh, who we talk about as the owners. If a person uh, has a little plot of land with a small house sitting on it, and that is basically their only wealth, I understand that this needs a lot of protection from whatever interference there may come. However, if someone, a company owns 50,000 or 500,000 apartments, I do not believe that the same rules should apply that apply to the small owner, but they do. And I think that in, 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 in most countries that I'm aware of, they do. And I think that it would be worth remembering uh, the, the teachings of Leon Degui, who said that with regard to corporate uh, property, uh, property is not a right, but a social function. And as long as the owner uses the land, in accordance with this social function, their interest would be protected in court. But the moment they do not act in accordance with the social function of their land, they just lose the land. It is going to be taken away. And this is not even an expropriation because their property rights do not extend further than the social function. Leon Degui was quite popular, or the social function theory was quite popular in uh, Latin America, and many uh, constitutions mention the social function of property or property as a social function. Interestingly enough, the Italian constitution uses the word social function in with respect to property protection. But basically, we have lost this idea and the huge financialization of housing stocks, I think, are a very good example um, where property has been going into a wrong direction. And that should and could be reined in by going a little bit further, stepping away uh, from uh, these uh, very um, exclusionary views of, of private property rights, and we should move into the direction of property as a social function. Maybe that is not the solution for everything, Tuna, but I think it would be a huge step in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we had a great discussion, but unfortunately, the time is already almost over. We still have five minutes left. So I want to ask uh, both the, the panelists and the discussant to summarize in one sentence what was the most inspiring thing they, they heard today in this panel. Um, and I will start uh, with Rachel. Ah. Uh, Ute asked a question. Hello, am I, where am I? Oops, I yes. lost. Excuse me, I lost the view. Here you are. Ah, well, actually, I'll I'll uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll go with Ute's uh, uh, question, and, and in fact, Ute would love to talk to you uh, in person. Ute asked, "Are there different views among planners internationally?" And that, that and, and the answer is yes, of course. But this leads me back to the reality check and the need for, for planning education, for planners to learn uh, uh, not only what we wish for, which we teach, and don't misunderstand me, that's been my role 
in my research and my teaching, and I've, yes, produced a lot of change and continue to produce and will continue to produce a lot of change. But in order to produce change, one has to understand institutions and economics and politics. Uh, planners in different countries have very different ethics. In many countries of the world, planners are architects. Think the architects see themselves as the urban planners and they don't study any planning theory, ethics or justice and law. They will study a bit of planning law only in the instruments, if at all. So yes, there's lots of differences. Um, a, and of course, then there is a, the geopolitical differences, there's cultural differences. So the talk that we are now having is very much a crust, a crust of a discussion. And this kind of discussion will not link, uh, uh, one more word, the UN Habitat uh, proposed a, a, a revolution in what they called planning law, urban law, which all it does is talk about the need to subdivide land and allocate room for streets. That is a big revolution. Okay, so let's take proportionality and context into account in our good wishes to be angels and continue to try to be angels. Great, thank you so much, Rachel. Okay, Francesco, in one word, what was the oh, one sentence, what was the most inspiring thing you heard today? Okay, uh, let, let's say, uh, I don't have to forget the structural inter in an intimate intertwining of exclusion and inclusion in law and, and policy. And if I can provide you a, a reference uh, to read about it, read the, the wonderful book, uh, Word of Luigi Mazza on this, which is exactly about planning and law and the exclusion and inclusion uh, structural relationship. That is Great, great, thank you so much. Uh, ben, what was the most inspiring thing you heard today? I already mentioned that I admire Tobias for noticing the arc of my personal uh, development in my presentation. Uh, and I would say that uh, I will continue this afternoon thinking about uh, Francesco's second uh, hypothesis that the complexity of law is often reduced too much. I would, would like to have more time to discuss that with Francesco because I totally agree. And uh, the thing is, if you are teaching planning students, you only can do so and so much. You, you cannot really go into the same details you would uh, discuss in law school. Uh, but that doesn't and must not mean that we stop teaching law to um, planning students. In fact, I think it would be really very much worth to examine in a comparative way, how do planning schools in Europe teach law to planning students? And I expect it ranges from ignoring everything to if it's an architectural school, uh, to uh, in-depth uh, analysis of, of the law as if it was uh, is, is a little law school. Thank you so much. Thank you. Or, or if it's um, Ben's school and his inheritor, or my school, I mean, it also takes the persons to, to or Francesco teaching. It, ta it takes the people to, to, to change reality also. Definitely does. does. Uh, and Tobias, in one sentence, the most inspiring thing. Well, the most I, want to I want to take a minute. I didn't understand your question when uh, uh, Michael and Michel, that oh. I should summarize what I learned. So I tried to, uh, I want to thank Tobias a bit, uh, uh, personally, uh, because I, I, I loved his analysis and, and thank you, Tobias. So I learned, yes. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, my, for me, this most thought-provoking thing uh, I've heard was uh, Ben's idea of the social function of property rights, because that's for a lawyer a very stingy idea. We are we are trained with the idea that property rights is alpha and omega, and then is a that true? Well, Still, nah, I'm exaggerating. The social function is all over. It's in I'm, the in the European Constitution. Yes, but when I say property rights in a private law context, uh, it means you can do so much with it. But what what I and why I was thought provoked with that idea is that I'm thinking of the position of the judge 
who has to assess the social function. And that brings us to theories of justice. And that brings us to another remark of Ben's that we do not agree about what justice might be, but we might agree about what injustice might be. So if we can develop some sort of apophatic theory of justice, what is injustice, then we might be getting somewhere in agreeing yeah. law and planning. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank um, you very much. We can continue for hours more, uh, I'm sure. Um, but luckily, there are great conferences like PLPR that will be organized this summer, thanks to uh, COVID. Um, and luckily, uh, we also continue uh, organizing webinars. And the next webinar is the 11th of February, where we discuss uh, recent changes in Belgium and the Dutch planning law. This could be really interesting because there's an attempt to change the culture of practitioners through law. Um, in February the 25th, we will talk about uh, European directives because nobody knows whether it's policy or whether it's law. Um, and we end this webinar series with uh, talking about uh, law and policy issues in urban regeneration projects. We have great speakers, so I'm really excited and the organizing team is also very excited. Um, we're going to finish this webinar. We will also upload uh, the recordings so that people can keep being inspired i would love to thank the audience for their very interesting questions and they really make this discussion um, be a lively one and, and i want to especially also organize uh Ebru and gumets who did a wonderful job in organizing this event thank you so much and thank you to the speakers for this excellent exchange of uh thinking and minds thank you so much <laughs>